Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. If you would turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 21. I entitled the message, Discerning God's Will. And in our scripture today, it brings the subject of discerning God's will to the surface. And I know this is a subject that's a big deal for all, for all of us. How many times have we had to make decisions, you know, in our lives? And we continue to make decisions and there's changes in our lives. And as Christians, we care about God's will, amen? And we wanna do God's will. And in our story today, we see a church that's concerned for Paul's life because God has, through the Holy Spirit, has directed Paul to go to Jerusalem and the church doesn't want him to go there because they know that suffering lies ahead. But Paul, he's not actually in agreement with them. He wants to go, even if he is to die for his faith. But in fairness to the church, they are referring to Jerusalem here where Jesus was crucified, where Stephen was stoned. And so they're thinking if Paul goes there, he's done because the Holy Spirit has warned him that suffering lies ahead. And so they are concerned for his life. Paul, not so much. He's concerned, ready for this, to do God's will. Even if it means to suffer and to die. And so that's where we're gonna be here today. And then I wanna help us know how to discern God's will in our life. Now, there's a lot of people in this room. So my application, you know, if you could apply it to your life as needed. There's many things I could teach on this subject, but we're in this subject today because of the scripture, it brings that to the surface. So as we go to apply this, I pray that you can apply it the way you need to in your life. And if you are not in a place where you're needing God's direction on something specifically for your life or your family, consider how you could guide those around you, amen? Let's go to uh, Acts, I need, I need to go to Acts. Acts 21, let me do a light check. We made a joke earlier, the first service is a little dark upstairs. It's nice and bright, I can see you. We were nervous about you know, the sermon last week where Eutychus was sitting on the edge and fell asleep and died. We just wanna make sure you know, we're not making it harder for you to stay awake today. Uh, you know, and stay away from the, the ledge, if you don't mind, and if you are tired. So it looks like we're okay, and it's good to see your faces upstairs. People upstairs are like, I come to church every week, and we just can't see you, you know, it's, it's so dark. So we wanted the lights up brighter, so it's good to see you up there. All right, Acts 21, verse 1 says, After saying farewell to the Ephesian elders, we sailed straight, straight to the island of Kos. The next day we reached Rhodes and then went to Patera. There we boarded a ship sailing for Phoenicia. We sighted the island of Cyprus, passed it on our left, and landed at the harbor of Tyre in Syria, where the ship was to unload its cargo. You gotta love Luke and his details of history, huh? He went ashore, found the local believers, this is Paul, we went ashore, found the local believers and his companions that were with him and Luke and stayed with them a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Jerusalem. Some of your translations say through the Holy Spirit they urged him not to go to Jerusalem. That seems like a conflict in scripture, doesn't it? So I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. When we returned to the ship at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including women and children, left the city and came down to the shore with us. There we knelt, prayed, and said our farewells. Then we went on aboard and they returned home. And remember, he's on his way to Jerusalem. The next stop after leaving Tyre was Ptolemus, where we greeted their brothers and sisters and stayed for one day. The next day we went on to Caesarea, or some say uh, Caesarea, and stayed at the home of Philip, the evangelist. Everyone remembers him, right? In chapter uh, seven, chapter eight, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. That, that's an interesting house. <laughs> like they could like confirm each other's prophecy, you know? Get quadruple confirmation if needed. Um, but the point of that is he's saying that you know, Philip had a godly home and that his, his daughters were serving the Lord. It's pretty cool. 
Verse 10 says, several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt, and bound his own feet and hands with it. Very dramatic, but this is what prophets would do sometimes to get people's attention, to show, this is what the word of the Lord is saying to me. And he took the belt, he, and he bound his hands and his feet to show them what's, what's gonna happen to Paul if he goes to Jerusalem. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But he said, why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Man, he's, Paul is no joke, isn't he? He's dedicated to the Lord's will. And when it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. Let's discuss this difficult verse, verse four, where it said, these believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit in the New Living Translation or uh, through the Spirit, they urged him not to go in other translations. There's different views on this. Uh, the basic uh, view here would be is that they prophesied that he would also go to Jerusalem and endure suffering, but they didn't want him to go, so their flesh said, don't go. So they prophesied through their flesh, so to say. They spoke out of their flesh, don't go. And that may be a better rendering of this, especially from the Greek into the English. And so if you see a translation that says, uh, through the spirit, they urge him not to go, that would be very accurate. Um, you know, people get prophecy wrong sometimes. Sometimes we will prophesy uh, more bent towards what we want or what we think God wants and not actually what God wants to say. And that is possible. Uh, one thing is for sure though in this verse, is once again, it's proving that the Holy Spirit is right, that God's right, he is going to suffer if he goes forward. So Paul already knew that in Acts 20. The Holy Spirit already warned him, we read that last week, that he would uh, have hardships ahead. And so Paul's already aware of this, he's not really concerned about that. The only concern he has is being obedient to the Lord and going where he needs to go. Let's not forget too, he's headed to Jerusalem to bring money from the Gentile churches to Jerusalem to provide for the church, but also to bring unity to the Jews and the Gentiles. In other words, hey, we are with you. We are also believer, believers of Jesus Christ. Yes, we come from uh, different nations and races and we, we do different things, but we also believe in Jesus and we have brought a gift to show you that we support you as a church because you're our church too. Together we're one church. It was a powerful testimony and Paul is determined to do this, but Paul is going first of all because the Lord led him to. So we see here that they are nervous about his life. And so they don't want him to go. And so I would say this, we do need to be careful of false prophecies. And if this was what Luke wanted to show, which um, theologians don't believe so, Luke is gonna show the error of the church too because the Bible's real about mankind's failures too, isn't it? So this isn't going to make me question whether the validity of scripture is true, whether I can trust the Bible or not. This isn't gonna make me question that. Jesus, or, or the gospel show that everyone abandoned Jesus before he was crucified. If, if the Bibles wanted to show uh, more evidence, they would have shown them being faithful, but instead they were being genuine. The Bible's genuine with us. So mankind can mess up when it comes to prophecy. What's interesting is God sends another prophet. His name is Agabus in our story today. And Agabus takes the belt, binds his hands and feet and says, this is, this is what's gonna happen to the man who goes, to Paul. And so he doesn't say don't go, he says this is what's gonna happen. In other words, he's saying Paul's gonna go. And none of them wanted him to go. So they're trying to persuade him, don't go to Jerusalem, you're gonna die. You think about this, the, the great, a great leader, a man of God, we need him on the front lines. Don't go to Jerusalem. This is what they're trying to do. They're trying to persuade him not to do that. And Paul is more concerned with being faithful to God. How many of us need to be like that too, amen? amen. Fear God over man. Respect God's decision and will over mankind. Well, we're gonna see now that Paul finally arrives in Jerusalem. Let's go to verse 15. After this, we packed our things and left for Jerusalem. 
Some believers from Caesarea accompanied us and they took us to the home of Nason, a man originally from Cyprus and one of the early believers. When we arrived, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to meet with, with James and all the elders of the Jerusalem church were present. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of the things God had accomplished among the Gentiles through his ministry. After hearing this, they praised God. That must have been cool to hear about all that God had done among the Gentiles. And then they said, you know, dear brother, they're talking to Paul, how many thousands of Jews have also believed and they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. So when, when Jewish believers became Christians, they didn't necessarily stop all their Jewish customs, okay? But the Jewish believers, verse 21 says, here in Jerusalem have been told, there's been a rumor going around, that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the law of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children or follow other Jewish customs. What should we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. And this is what James goes on to say. Here's what we want you to do. We have four men here who have completed their vow. This is the Nazarite vow that Paul took earlier on in our, in our study. Go with them to the temple and join them in the purification ceremony, paying for them to have their heads ritually shaved. Then everyone will know that the rumors are all false and that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. As for the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in a letter. They should abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. This is a really interesting um, correspondence here. What's going on is basically this rumor has spread that Paul is discouraging Jewish believers from practicing their customs, and he's never done that. He's taught to the Gentiles and told them they don't have to adopt the customs of Jewish practices. So this rumor has been twisted. And what James suggests is that you and your companions go ahead and do a Nazarite vow to quell the tensions that are going on. And Paul has no problem with this because in Corinthians, what does he say? I'm willing to become all things to all men so that I might win some. Paul is willing to practice some of these customs to keep unity in the body of Christ. Paul is willing, if he's willing to do that for un, unsaved people, he's willing to do that for those who are saved and in the family of God. He wants to preserve peace. He's not doing it for salvation. He's not going to do some Jewish custom or follow some Jewish um, sacrifices or things like that for salvation or sanctification. He's simply doing it for unification. All right? So Paul is willing to do that. He is clarified in scripture clearly that if it's going to help with peace, if it's going to help with salvation, I'm willing to come under the law even to reach those who are Jews. In other words, he'll, he'll go back to his roots and practice some things and wash his hands and his body and whatever else he has to do if he's going to go to someone's house and have fellowship with a Jew. That's just smart. You know, our missionaries are like that. <laughs> One of the trainings that our missionaries get is eating food that you would never eat in America so that you don't insult the people that you're visiting in other countries. And boy, do they get served some gross stuff. Here, drink, drink. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, someone give me a bucket. So Paul's doing that, and what a, what a brilliant missionary and, and a man of God. You know, the Lord's leading him on this. I think James and the elders give great advice here. And so, you know, no one's harmed. But how many know that when good things are happening, the devil likes to mess things up? Verse 26, so Paul went to the temple the next day with the other men. They had already started the purification ritual, so he publicly announced the date when their vows would end and sacrifices would be offered for each of them. The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and aroused a mob against him. Here we go again. The sixth time this has happened in scripture in the book of Acts to Paul. These are people from the province of Asia where Paul just left. They had come to Jerusalem to also celebrate the festival. And so they're there and now they're going, oh, let's stir up the pot again. It's, it's Paul's nemesis from Asia once again coming to haunt him and cause issues. They grabbed him, yelling, men of Israel, help us. This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temp temple and even defiles this holy place by bringing in Gentiles. So they're lying 
And, and Luke gives us context. For earlier that day, they had seen him in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, one of Paul's traveling companions and helpers. And they assumed Paul had taken him into the temple. Okay, just so we understand in cultural context here, Jews do not go into the inside the temple where the Jewish court is. I'm sorry, Gentiles don't go into the Jewish court. They stay out in the outer court, in the outer courts of the temple. They're accusing Paul of bringing Trophimus inside the temple in the Jewish court where the men would be and to the Jews. That's defiling the temple and this man is worthy of death. So this is serious. These are serious false accusations. They basically said, yeah, I saw Trophimus in the city. He must have went into the temple. That's all they had to do. And they used that to stir up a mob to come against Paul and his companions. And so things are getting a little messy here. Verse 30 says, the whole city was rocked by these accusations and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple and immediately the gates were closed behind him. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. So Paul is being beaten here now. This is the prophecy coming true. This is what Paul knew was coming. This is what the, the believers who even urged him not to go and maybe have spoken out of, out, of, out of their flesh rather than spirit. This is Agabus prophesying this would happen. So he's right. He has, he has already been beaten, but there's more to come here. Verse 33 says, then the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains. There you have it. There's the binding of the arms, the hands, the wrists, and the feet. He asked the crowd who, who, he was, who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing, some another. Since he couldn't find out the truth and all the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent, the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him. And the crowd followed behind shouting, kill him, kill him. And that's where we're gonna stop today. Crucify him, crucify him. Does that sound familiar too? Paul is... And by the way, Jesus warned him that he would suffer greatly. Remember when Jesus called him, he said, you will suffer for my name, but you will be a light to the Gentiles. And God wasn't done. God is setting up the stage for Paul to get to Rome. Because now the Roman commander has him in his possession and God is starting to work out his will for Paul's life. So, just, just a quick lesson for us all. God's will isn't always the smoothest journey, just so you know. But Paul had peace and confidence that God was gonna protect him and be faithful to him no matter what happens next. Church, we can be confident that the Lord is gonna take care of us in the immediate days ahead and in your future and your kids and everyone you're ministering to. If we would call upon him, if we would trust him, God is gonna take care of us. Hard times could be ahead in your life, but God is working something out for your good in his glory. Can we get an amen? <laughs> How do we discern God's will in our life? Today, we could be seeking God's will for a lot of things. What about this? Who to date, who to marry? Anyone in the market today for dating and marriage? No? <laughs> I want to put this in there. The Lord put this on my heart today. Some of you are fighting your marriage, and I want to say fight for your marriage. Is it God's will to stay together? Absolutely, it's God's will to stay together. It's God's will. It's always the better way to work, things, work on things in your marriage. I'm going to go ahead and answer that one for you, okay? There are some reasons why, though, there could be an issue with that, too. Okay, that's why we need godly counsel, but I'm putting that out there. God always wants you to work. God wants each individual person in a marriage to be holy and righteous before him so we'll treat each other with holiness and righteousness, amen? I know I took a, yeah, amen. Thank you for that clap so I can get some water too. What job should I take? 
Do I stay? Do I go? Should I buy a house or do I stick to renting one? God bless you right now if you're looking for a house. God help you. What career path should I take? I'm in, I'm in high school. I'm a junior. I'm a sophomore. I'm a senior. And do I go to college? Which college do I go to? What should be my life, my future? These are questions that we all have, amen? And I, I wish... I wish there was Keller Williams chapter two in the Bible that told you, you know, where to go and should I rent, should I buy? I wish, I wish there was marriage specifics that told you exactly what you need to do every single time. I mean, there's a lot of wisdom in the Bible about marriage. I wish, you know, there was a university chapter seven what, what university to go to or what career to go to and do. I, I wish all that, but the Bible won't give you specifics like that. What the Bible does give you is principles and biblical standards. The revealed will of God is the laws of God, the commands of God. Love the Lord your God. That sounds like a good command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go make disciples. Are those laws, are those, is that the will of God? We know we need to obey. Yeah, should we reach the lost and love the lost and help invite them to believe in Jesus and be saved and have everlasting life? Yes, the scriptures tell us that. Does the scripture say do not murder, do not steal, do not kill, do not destroy people, do all those things? Yes, it says don't do those things. So we know those things, but there are some things that it doesn't speak to specifically. But it is in scripture if we look at the principles of things. For instance, let me give you an example. Who should I date or marry? I know this, if you love God, you should look for someone who also loves God. Yeah. Right? And I'm gonna say this again for those of you who are on, on the hunt looking. Just because they say they go to church, why? Well, I mean, it's, it's the way it is. They wake up every day, come out of the house. <laughs> hey, if you're on the journey, just because they say they go to church does not mean anything. Yeah. They don't. What I want to encourage us to do is First and foremost, and I won't get into specifics of all those things, just again, let me remind you, we need to apply this to where we need to apply it to our lives today. I cannot speak to 500, 600 people in the room right now and say, this is what you should do for your life, your life, your life. And I wouldn't do that. I would point you to God first and God's word. Calvary, we as a church have had to seek and discern the Lord's will for many things. For instance, should we start a Christian school? And we did, back in 1985. And it's been helping our families and our children be raised in academics and godly biblical, world, our biblical worldview and principles. Thank the Lord for Calvary Christian Academy. Yeah. We had to seek the Lord on whether, do we feed the, do we feed the church when they're in need and help the, need with, uh, the, the needs in our church uh, with a lot of things, not just food? Um, and the community. Should we have a food pantry? Should we have a benevolence ministry? Over three decades ago, we decided to have that. And it was in scripture. Scripture showed us the importance of taking care of other people's needs, taking care of the body of Christ, physically, if there's a need, right? About five years ago, this, this young pastor was applying for the lead pastor position here at Calvary. And man, he, he, he was a strange guy. Talk about myself. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not telling on myself. I'm not perfect though. But you know, five years ago, we had to pray and I had to pray as a, as a, as a pastor, as a husband, as a father. Do I want to step into a lead role? We, we prayed, we sought scripture, we sought the help of other people in our lives. The church put me through a rigorous interview process, six hour interview. It was, wow, but you know, it was great. I was interviewed by our district superintendent who will be here soon um, for past appreciation to speak to us. They did a background check on me to make sure that I handled the fi the fi my own finances properly. 
I mean, we prayed, we fasted, I did, the church did, and then 300 people had to vote whether I'm the elected lead pastor. After I did a random Q&A when I didn't get the questions before and I had no idea what was gonna hit me. And I had to give the best answers according to the will of God. And all I said was, I'll do whatever the Lord wants me to do. It's his will over mine. Okay? So our church has been in situations where we've had to seek the, by the way, thank you for voting me in, all who are here that did that. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> yeah. I don't take that for granted. We've even sold property. We waited over a year to decide whether we sell a piece of property that was gifted to us. And now, right now, we're holding on to it for emergencies and it's growing interest right now to help us take care of people's needs and the church's mortgage and all those other things that we deal with. As God is giving us wisdom on what to do, right? But the Bible never said, sell the property. <laughs> Thank you, God. Yes, we'll do that. It didn't, we had to go through a list of things. So let me go into that. Here, here's six things to consider. You could say seven, eight, nine, ten. You could add so many. Number one, I'm going to go kind of quick through this because I went a little long last service. Number one, Christians follow God's will over their own. This is already implied, but I need to say it out loud. My friends, Paul, he was in this situation because he knew it's not about his will, it's about God's will. I want to do what God wants to do. As Christians, we understand this. We, our lives do not belong to us anymore. We've been bought at a high price by the blood of Jesus Christ. He gets a say about what we do. Now, that was a little quiet, but it was pretty good, amen. <laughs> and if this isn't your posture, young people, all the way up, all of our wise people here, I've been asking people, how young are you now instead of how old you are? Is that a good idea? <laughs> how young are you? Anyway. Look, when we surrender our lives, I'm telling you this, I promise you, I can tell you this for the fact, it won't necessarily be easy, but when we surrender our lives to do God's will, it's like things start falling into place. Oh my goodness, your, your eyes open up to see what God wants you to do. Because he's just waiting you, for you to let go of the steering wheel. Because it's not yours in the first place. <laughs> and so when, I, when I, uh, I found my wife actually at college by not trying to find my wife. I said, God, I'm done trying. It hasn't worked past two, two ladies. Okay, I've been choosing wrong, and you know what? I guess I need to stop, and I'm gonna focus on you. Three days later, like the resurrection of Jesus Christ, <laughs> this lady comes out of nowhere. Yeah. And, and I have to tell you this. I, I said, uh, God, uh, you're gonna have to bring her to me because I keep pursuing. You know how it is, guys, you're supposed to pursue, you know? They don't do that. We do it. I said, God, I'm done. You're gonna bring someone in my life, and she's the one that invited me to come hang out bowling with a bunch of other freshmen. I was a sophomore. I was like, yep, I'll see you there. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Two, we care about living in God's will. So not only do you say, God, um, not my will, but your will be done. Not this, my life is for you. We also continue to care what God wants me to do. And I know that goes unsaid, you know, but I'm going to say it out loud. I need to continue to care what God wants me to do. And that goes for in every area of my life. Just so you know, God gets every area of our lives, right? He doesn't get just this circle or this circle, but he should get every place of our lives. All right? When you care about living in God's will, this is a sign that you respect and fear the Lord and what he has for your life. You're concerned about God's desire for you rather than, this is what we typically do, unfortunately. We go to God with our will and ask him to bless it. Instead of going to God for his will and then ask him to help us follow it. 
We need to put our agenda aside and say, Lord, what is your will? Now, don't get me wrong. We should come to him with specific things. I'm not saying no agenda at all. What I'm saying is, are you willing to let go of what you think the answer is gonna be for the real answer that God has for you? And then like, if, if you take God's will over your own, it will be blessed, I can promise you that. It may not be easy, but it will be blessed. Thirdly, we discern God's will, this is so obvious, with God's word. This is how I need to see life. This, this I, my face needs to, and I don't mean like sleep, I, my face needs to be in the word of God, know God's word. And here's, here's the key thing here today. We need to have a relationship with God so when we hear his voice, we can tell it's him. And we can have that. You can, the, the, uh, the regular time with God creates a familiarity of his voice. You're able to recognize that that's what God wants me to do. You know, God, God is our shepherd and we are his sheep and the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. And when the shepherd says to do something, we go, that's God. The closer we are to God in his word, the better we're gonna know it's God saying, go this way, don't go that way. That person, no bueno, no good. Sometimes he speaks Spanish, I guess. Don't go that way. <laughs> don't go that way. You, you don't, don't, that's not the right person. When we have a relationship with him, that's what God can do. Remember, the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. His word will, will light the way for us. His lens is how we should look at everything. His scripture, excuse me, is the lens for which we look at everything. We should have a biblical worldview in every area of our life. Mm, all right, I'm gonna say it. Even politically. Even politically. Yeah. He's, he's a part of our entire life. Every, every decision we make, everything, even in the ballot or even the voting box in the booth, we even have to consider what God's word says because we are Christians. We are kingdom citizens before anything else. Yeah. All right, moving on. Number four, we discern God's will with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke to Paul first about going to Jerusalem. So Paul already knew he needed to go there. The Holy Spirit already worked on him on that. And now the Holy Spirit's starting to bring some confirmation into his life. And it's interesting that people try to persuade him from going, but that really just helped him know he's gotta go. Because they kept saying, you're gonna, you're gonna suffer if you go. I, I know, I already knew that. <laughs> And so he's, he's gonna go forward even with the confirmation, especially with Agabus, they could not persuade him, but God confirmed and gave him a heads up. And that's what I love. God will give you a heads up of what's to come. I have noticed he does that in my life too. So that you're not surprised and shaken, but you can stand firm and confident. I'm not surprised by this. I'm not surprised by this obstacle. Do you know that even in my own journey of purchasing a house, we faced obstacle after obstacle, but we knew we were supposed to move forward and we didn't let it stop us. We kept going and God blessed that journey and God took care of us. And I'm so glad he did. Instead of being discouraged and going, oh, this must not be the will of God. I felt in my heart, we must continue. And God made a way for us to be where we are today. He knew. But let me warn us of this. If prophecy from Christians is your go-to source of God's will, that's a mistake. Because what I'm referring to is, is that this church, if they got it wrong to Paul and they were trying to prophesy that he shouldn't go and they were saying, the spirit told me you shouldn't go. If that's what was actually happening here, which theologians don't believe so, they just believe basically that this is what's gonna happen if you do go and they didn't want him to go. But if that happens to you, well, the Spirit of God told me that, this, that you should do this or this, this, or this. You need to check that with Scripture and what the Holy Spirit's been telling you. And listen, if you're not having a vibrant, healthy relationship with God, you might fall for that. 
You might fall for that. Get with God, read his word, pray, wait, and listen for what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Online prophecies from Christians cannot be our first source of information. It cannot be our primary source of what to do next. We need to go to the word and let God lead us. Okay? Why? I mean, think about that for a second. We don't have to go to mankind for guidance first. We get to go to the Holy Spirit. We get to go to God who knows the beginning and the end. You know, God is outside of our timeline of, of space and time. He's, he's transcendent. He's not on our timeline. He is the past, the present, and the future all at once. <sighs> wow. He knows what's coming. He already knows. He's already been at the end. So why would we go to mankind first? We must go to the Lord and his word. Amen. But we got to get with God. We got to read his word. We got to pray. We got to wait. We got to listen for what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. Fifth, we discern God's will with godly counsel. We really do need brothers and sisters, pastors, mentors in our lives. You ready for this? Who are godly who will spend time with you to process these things and pray for you and not tell you what to do. Yeah, don't tell people what to do first. We point them to have a relationship with the Lord and let the Lord speak to them through their personal relationship and their time in the word. We need to be godly in case someone comes to us one day, right? Think about that. Like if if we know the Father's voice, we all have one shepherd, if, if you know the Father's voice, you're going to be able to be able to discern that, oh, that sounds like the voice of God right there. Yeah. Hey, sister, thank you. I went home. I prayed. I took your, what you're going through and what you need into consideration, and I believe you've been hearing God's voice already. He's been telling you what to do because you have the same shepherd, and you hear the same voice. By the way, good godly counsel will say the same thing because you're hearing the same God. Confirm the same thing in the word. And just so you know though, I, I did this in order for a reason. We go to God's word first before we go to mankind. Okay, and a lot of times godly counsel will confirm the word of God. I need to be, uh, give you a, a warning. Beware of counsel that encourages you to take the easy path though. Now this is very specific and I just think that sometimes we need to hear this I want to go to Matthew 16. It won't be on the screen, but I want to read this to you. This was a difficult scenario. You know, this is a difficult situation. Jesus was predicting his death to his disciples, and this is what happens. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly, this is uh, Matthew 16, 21, that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, just like Paul, and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law, He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being a fly on the wall or one of the other disciples and go, oh my goodness, he did not do that. Did he really do that? Did Peter take Jesus to the side? Oh no. And corrected Jesus Lightning, you're looking for lightning. You're like, Peter, you can stay right there. I'm staying right here. Heaven forbid, Lord. This is what Peter says. This will never happen to you because they wanted him to be a ruler. But he wanted to die for their sins so they could have everlasting life. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Church, if we're going to give godly counsel, we need to make sure we're hanging out with God. We need to make sure that we're not speaking in a way that actually is going to be against God's will. And not everything that we do or that what God calls us to do is going to be easy. Jesus was saying, I'm going to suffer and die. 
For us, it may not be an easy path forward. And I, let me give you an example on that just to help us uh, interpret this. Someone comes to you and says, I'm living with someone, we're living in sin, we shouldn't be together, we're not married, and I, and I feel like I'm supposed to stop. What do I do? You know how hard that's gonna be to cut off everything and follow Jesus? Do you know that I get that question quite often? Because to, to be having premarital sex together before marriage is a sin. And there's not an easy answer for it, except the hardest answer. You stop doing that and you separate. So you can concentrate on God and then love each other without the intimacy. Because you get to enjoy that later after marriage. And I get it, that apparently that sounds really old school today, but the Bible is still proper and right and tells the truth. And it knows what's best for marriages and relationships. So when people ask me that, I give them the hard answer. I don't give them the easy answer, I give them the hard answer. Because to do the Lord's will is gonna take picking up a cross, denying self and following Jesus. Actually, let me read that to you because that's actually the next verses. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. This is Matthew 16 right after this. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? What does it benefit you if you have a relationship you like but you lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Of course not, right? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. Jesus will come with all the angels of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Church, Jesus does not pull any punches. And we gotta be careful that we don't give an easy answer either. Oh, that's okay because the Bible's a little outdated. No, that's a lie. Oh, you know, God would understand because it costs so much to live in our economy. Mm. Listen, brothers, sisters, find a married couple that has an extra place to stay for a little bit then. Or gentlemen, buy a ring and get married already. Right? Something. Get some counseling, get some mentoring. I think, yeah. Like, I think I just heard someone go, oh, yeah, you hurry up, brother. <laughs> Anyone hits elbows right into the ribs. Oh, man. Why, why do I say this? Because I care about your soul more than your human relationship with someone else. What good is it to forfeit your soul? for something here on earth that will fade away. And lastly, we choose what will bring honor and glory to God. In the end, there are times where you're really not sure what to do next because it doesn't say it clearly in scripture. It may give you some principles, but here's an example. Both decisions are actually a good decision. Like it won't hurt you. What do you do? Whatever you do, you, do, you choose to give God glory in whatever you do. God will work out all the details. There are times where we have to just, God has given us the wisdom and the free will to choose. And you know, we have made mistakes. Isn't God so gracious and merciful that even when we made mistakes, he helps us get out of that mistake? And we didn't choose wisely, we didn't choose right, but he's there to help us get back on track. Isn't that good? Isn't God so faithful like that? So yeah, we're gonna make mistakes and God knows that and he's patient and gracious about that. But in the end, what we need to do is make sure whatever we choose to do, when we're discerning God's will, let's make sure we can give God glory in it. So it may be that job. It may be, this one's easy. If you're gonna do a Bible study or trying to reach your coworkers at your, at your office, and you're gonna host a Bible study during lunch, we all know that that is a command from God to make disciples. Now, you might have to discern who should you start inviting first. Yeah, you seek the Holy Spirit on that and all those other things, all right? All I'm saying is, as long as you choose to honor God in your decision, 
He will take care of you. Amen? If you can, why don't we stand as we close in prayer. Here's another tip for you. If you don't know what to do, one of the best things to do is wait. Wait on the Lord for clarity, for direction. And if it's gonna bring honor to God, then you're good. If you're able to still have a relationship with the Lord and not be compromised in any way, you're good. You can go forward, all right? Not everything is spelled out for us like we want it to be spelled out. God is also wanting us to step out and trust him. And to trust him that he's leading us too. I told this story in the first service. I'll tell you that there were times and there has been times in my life still, even recently, where I believed I knew what I was supposed to do, but fear of the outcome and doubt came rushing in And I was struggling to pull the trigger on that decision and make that decision. And the Lord had to speak to me through a dream or speak to me through a person to say, you've been hearing my voice right. Look out, the devil's trying to deceive you. Or he's, we don't have a spirit of fear, right? That's what Paul told Timothy. We don't have a spirit of fear, but I love power and sound mind and self-control. So God had to warn me you're under attack. You know what to do. I keep showing you in scripture. You keep getting confirmation. Doors keep opening up. It, for me, it's a matter of stepping out in faith and going forward. And it's a, it's, a, it's a decision that will impact many lives in this community. We're praying about how we can reach our community better. It's a decision that I've been seeking the Lord on. It's, it's a direction to take our church to seek the Lord on. And God has been showing me again and again what we need to do. I'm excited to announce something like that in the future, but I'm working on it behind the scenes. But it's gonna bless our community and even our church, amen? Amen. So, yes. Hey, let's pray because we need to go to God for these situations that you could be in. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, God. Lord, that you led Paul to where he needed to be because you had plans beyond what he could see. You had plans beyond what we can see. You're eternal God. You know what's next. Lord, teach us to trust you. Give us peace moving forward, Lord. And even if it gets tough, give us peace that you're working out everything for our good and your glory. Lord, we give these situations to your hands. But most of all, God, we want to be in a relationship with you so that we can hear your voice and your direction. So lead us as we hang out with you, as we spend quality, devoted time with you, Lord, I pray your voice will be louder than anything else in our head, in our hearts. And Lord, even use godly counsel to confirm things. Lord, we give you these situations, these decisions, our future. Lord, we pray for our nation, Lord. We pray for our community, God. We pray for our church that you would lead us forward for your will to be done here in America, for your will to be done in Delaware, for your will to be done in Dover and in our church, Lord. We ask for your will to be done and we trust you, God. Lead and guide us in every area of our lives. God, you've called us to spread throughout this world, to bring your kingdom here on earth, So Lord, help us to be kingdom citizens that do what you've called us to do. Thank you, Lord, for your example of Paul. Thank you for his faithfulness. Help us to be faithful to your call in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.